Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Philips Lighting Pioneers of Light Specifier debate entitled The Shape of Lighting to Come, IoT Real-Time Data for Co-Creation. Without further ado, I will um, let the panellists introduce themselves. My name is Pierre Panis. Um, I, um, I joined Philips Lighting a little less than three years ago. I'm a product designer by training. Um, and. Um, I, I lead a team of about 70 uh, designers in four locations. And when we talk about designers, we talk about multidisciplinary approaches to design. So they're architects and lighting designers, of course, as you can imagine, product designers, interaction designers, uh, user interaction designers, and user experience designers. Um, what is behind on, on the posters is something that we very, very um, um, seriously um, believe in. We, we believe in co-creation. We, we are moving into a more and more connected world. And, and of course, light and uh, the effects of light on people, on population, on users, um, is, is, is of course something that is at the core of what we deliver as a company. But light is also connected to many sensors, of course, and, many, uh, and therefore many opportunities to bring more value in terms of usage to users. And so through a design uh, approach, through a design co-creation, we are trying to make sense of uh, yeah, this, uh, this world of IoT. And that's what I'm looking forward to this panel today. OK. Simona? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Simona Maschi. I come from Italy. I'm actually trained as an architect many, many years ago and not really practiced that much as an architect. But I founded together with other five people a place in Copenhagen called CIID, which stands for Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design, which is a place where we work on innovative product services and strategies, looking very much at co-creation and prototyping as a key process. And I think uh, my whole message today is very much about looking at technology uh, and the potential of IoT maybe as like the how to do things, but I'm very focused on maybe supporting the dialogue in terms of what's the why, why, what to do, and, and especially why to do uh, innovation with light. Mm -hmm. So very focused on the process, very focused on prototyping and learning by doing, and uh, challenge the idea of moving from maybe a company-centric way of doing to a value creation uh, way of doing, where basically we need to be open to to accept the fact that we can use technology, we can come up with new applications, but we might not know all the answers as a company, as an organization, and really enable everyone to contribute and come up with input, feedback, and, and co-create solutions. So moving from being an organization maybe that not expects to know all the answers, but kind of is, uh, is targeted to deliver solutions to becoming an organization which is open to engage in dialogues that we might not be able to forecast right now with people and stakeholders that are not in dialogue with the organizations today. So open innovation, that's my message. So, uh, good morning, my name is David Gatan. I'm a lighting designer with CM Klingon Associates. We're based in Washington, DC. Uh, I'm also the president for the International Association of Lighting Designers. Uh, which is headquartered in the United States, but we have a, a regional office in Brussels and uh, membership worldwide. Uh, I think I approach lighting design very much as a storytelling and a narrative concept. And so as we take that specialty and begin to apply it and, and bring in the ideas of co-creation and the introduction of further technologies that enable the end user, it, it broadens that, that ability to bring depth to that story and uh, resonance to that story to make it relevant to the, to the end user. So that's what I'm bringing to the table today. Hello everyone, my name is Francesco Anselmo. I work as a lighting and interaction designer at Arup. Um, I, um, yeah, I've also trained uh, and uh, worked uh, throughout 14 years of career in Arup as a lighting designer, but my role has sort of gradually been uh, changing and transforming towards uh, um, integrating different systems in buildings and trying to making them meaningful for uh, for people and uh, um, and so in this sort of transformative uh, um, process we are we all we all are in uh, making our buildings uh, gradually more digitalized and uh, um, connected. Uh, uh, I'm looking really at all the opportunities uh, that uh, this connectivity can bring uh, that are not uh, necessarily. I mean, lighting is one of the various. Uh, 
um, sort of pieces in this jigsaw of connectivity in buildings. And so um, more widely, I think I'm really um, interested into how open protocols, uh, open APIs, uh, more collaborations uh, um, across uh, players, uh, you know, designers in, in buildings and designers in interactions. We have four <coughs> designers, an integration designer, stroke lighting designer, a lighting designer, an interaction designer and a product designer. So it'll be interesting to see the different opinions that they have. Um, but just to get the, everything into context, I want to start with Pierre-Yves uh, and ask, can you define the Philips lighting approach to IoT, real-time data collection and, and co-creation? Um, it is about um, uh, making sure that it is not technology pushed. It is not necessarily, yes, it is digital, but it does not necessarily need to be in its interaction with the user's digital. And um, whatever it is that we can, um, wherever we can extract data, leverage data, use data, um, and, and, and the technology that then can be leveraged with all this data, it should be done for a purpose. And the purpose um, cannot, um, you know, is, is not unique in a sense. Um, of course, we also heard the word sustainability. We heard um, uh, probably, I don't think anybody talked about efficiency yet, but, um, you know, we also talk about efficiency. Um, I will not, I mean, I, I will want to hear from, you know, from, from Simona. We talked a little bit before this, um, uh, this panel this morning. I will want to hear more about uh, sustainability because, of course, as a company, it's something, and as designers, as practicing designers, it's something that we care deeply about. Uh, making our buildings more efficient, making our buildings you know, uh, more um, uh, uh, connected, of course, but not for connectivity's sake. Um, you know, why? And, and uh, another thing that was, of course, um, expressed in the, in the few minutes uh, as we were introducing ourselves is, is, is prototyping quickly. Prototyping, testing, prototyping, testing. Um, not go in this with, uh, you know, a dogmatic approach to things. Um, this is something that for a designers, uh, you know, a designer approach, a designer point of view is actually very suited to. So I would like to say maybe in, 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 in conclusion to your question is that um, design typically uh, in an organization, and this is very much the case within Philips Lighting, um, uh, design is making sure that the users, the stakeholders, are looked after, are taken into consideration. We as designers are trying to make sure that through the process, we deliver um, a value and, and um, uh, I don't understand what's happening with my mic, but apparently it works much better if I turn <laughs> left than if I turn right. Um, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that um, uh, we, we develop uh, experiences and interactions that are meaningful. Um, that's, that's what we as designers do. As uh, an editor of a light in design magazine, I'd like to cut to the chase and ask the, the president of the IALD, what does this all mean for light in design? <laughs> well, obviously a loaded <laughs> topic, uh, which I'm not sure we'll have the full time for, but Maybe focus for a moment on co-creation and the possibilities of IoT in that. Uh, as lighting designers, we always strive to provide the best solution for the end user, whether that's an individual or a corporation, or, but we don't always have the granular uh, access to the person actually interacting with the lighting systems. And as you bring in the other technologies through, through the pick, uh, possibilities and capabilities of IoT, obviously the, the interaction with all those other systems. So what co-creation, I think, does in beginning to focus on that allows that dialogue to happen in a, in a valuable and structured way that can do prototyping, get instant feedback, and improve the design and improve that end result. Uh, my concern, and, and I think it's something that needs to be evaluated in that process is how we bring these components in while maintaining what we know as quality lighting and perhaps improve upon our definition of quality lighting through it and rather than getting caught up in just the wonder of widgets and gadgets and gizmos and bytes and bits as, as we've kind of discussed. So how, how to find that, that true balance between a designer who's telling somebody what they need and a, a user who uh, is 
being educated in that process to understand better and define what it actually is that they want. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's interesting because I, I've just returned from a trip to Singapore where I spoke to around eight lighting designers and, and actually seven lighting designers had no interest in co-creation and the internet of things. But the other lighting designer who's, who's in this audience now has gone wholeheartedly into the, into the internet of things by teaming up with a, a platform provider. Uh, so he's embracing the, the, the technology. So it's interesting how different lighting designers uh, look upon it differently. I mean, Francesco, do, do you think it's going to change the way lighting design is, is practiced? I mean, we've, we've gone through a big change already, I would say, you know, from uh, the, the introduction of LEDs uh, has totally revolutionized, I think, already, the way we, we, we design lighting. And in a way, it's actually brought uh, freedom, a certain degree of freedom, uh, that we didn't have because we were more... Uh, looking at the, the, the lamp and the fitting and, you know, these sort of objects. Uh, but while now um, integration into architecture can happen more easily. And part of that is about uh, modularization. So form factors, you know, these sort of points and lines uh, and sort of uh, surfaces that we can now um, weave into the fabric of a building much more easily is down to, to really, um, you know, manufacturers and designers working together into um, addressing, uh, um, you know, how these things uh, get uh, um, placed, uh, how they get connected from an electrical perspective uh, and, and now from a data perspective as well, so from, from a control. So control has been uh, a huge uh, pain, I would say, for a, for a long time because, you know, we have good ideas about how things uh, should work, uh, but then uh, um, because specification not necessarily always happen in a way where um, we can uh, have a strong influence on the last, uh, on, on the on the end product that gets in. Um, lots of things get sort of lost in this translation of. Uh, um, I mean, there has been um, obviously efforts into standardizing interfaces uh, from a technological perspective, uh, but from a perspective of actually creating this uh, narrative of, of user or uh, this uh, um, you know methodology, this uh, interface, uh, human you know human to machine or lighting in this case interface uh, has not been I would say so successful so the opportunity that we have now with um, uh, getting this approach where uh, potentially we could become uh, even creators uh, of the of the interaction itself by programming you know prototyping I mean I mean really literally writing the code uh, um, using uh, the APIs actually that uh, are given to us uh, to connect, you know, integrate different systems uh, is, a, is a great opportunity I see, um, if done well. And part uh, of that doing well is about how modular, uh, you know, the system is, how many components are given to us uh, to bring them together. Similarly to the, you know, to the dots and the lines and the surfaces, right? Uh, the same thing is about, uh, um, you know, how do, we, how do we get a sensor, you know, being working, not just, uh, maybe that is embedded into a luminaire, but, you know, working uh, for AV, working for, uh, um, you know, digital signage, working for, uh, um, you know, um, occupancy. So these are all things that actually can improve a lot uh, um, as sort of ideas. And I think, uh, um, you know, lighting is, uh, you know, is, is one of, I mean, maybe it's one of the, comp is the components that has a, um, a, a better um, sort of possibility of, of transforming uh, this interaction because it's visual, a lot of this interaction cues are, come with uh, um, you know, visual feedback and so you know, we, have, we have that element of responsibility. After all, light is uh, emotion but it's also information and so we can use it uh, you know, in, in, in these different ways. But I'm very interested to hear from Simona coming from a non-lighting perspective about what she feels are the, the opportunities that this new tech can bring yeah. to everyone. Well, as I said in our very brief uh, call some weeks ago, I'm a very optimistic person in general, so I only look at the opportunities. And I think, uh, uh, again, the so-called Internet of Things and data flowing in the, in the platforms are just like bringing up new opportunities. And there are a few. Uh, first of all, I think even though we are here to talk about co-creation and uh, the big agenda for sustainability and so on, there is a great opportunity also from an economic perspective and commercial perspective because if you zoom out a little bit from the picture, co-creation means that rather than having a group of smart people within four walls coming up with very innovative ideas that are normally very secretive, uh, based on assumptions of what, you know, marketing uh, research and uh, market analysis and all the kind of 
hypotheses and assumptions about how the future would be and how people will react to our new products. Now we can rely on platforms where actually we have all data flowing in into the company, into the organization, giving real-time information about what people like, how people behave, how the world is changing. So co-creation also means that we are open to have that data in real time in the making of innovation, not within the four walls, but open with society, with people interacting with our innov innovative processes, which also means reducing the risk of failure when we go to market. Because we move from being in a situation where we think we can control the whole process and make forecasts about how people will react and how the market will respond to our innovation, to a system when there is a much more fluid process. So, we reduce the risk of failure, so less surprises when we come to the market. So that's a good, great opportunity. The second one, I think, is um, uh, the idea of, we talk about co-creation as a way to engage between an organization, in this case, in case maybe Philips Lighting, and end users. But I think we can uh, even look like at the bigger picture, and uh, not just the end users, as, as the people will eventually be in contact with light or, or your products, but I would really look at society at large at uh, moving from a situation where we are in a, set, in a kind of company-centric view into a, I would really call it life-centered view. What can light do for people, for societies, for communities, for schools, for hospitals? And uh, as I said, if we look at IoT as the answer and as the how we do things, I think we, we're all aware that you know, the world has very big challenges. Uh, for those who are familiar, uh, there is something called the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which is a very, very clear framework that the United Nations have set up. This is a little symbol for the goals. And so the agenda is pretty set. I mean, by 2030, there are very clear goals that we are all asked to, to work uh, on. We are all asked to uh, act on and make sure that we think about not just the future, the future of products, but also the future of the planet. So, the big agenda is set, and I think uh, the brainstorming should start very soon in terms of what can light do to achieve those goals and what can organi an organization like Philips Lighting actually do. And I'm sure that the brainstorming is already happening. There are se uh, two very clear goals, number seven and number 11, which are about sustainable energy and sustainable communities and cities, which are like the obvious match for like the crowd today and, and for the work that we all do uh, going forward. So. When we talk also about co-creation and we think about, okay, how can we engage not just with end users, but vendors, customers, policy makers, anyone involved in the supply chain of ultimately delivering better societies for the future and, and also through light, I think there is also a new opportunity, which is the fact that we will engage with stakeholders and people who simply come with different expertise, different backgrounds, different expectations. And they all kind of use different languages. They all come with very different, again, expertise. So at that point, prototyping becomes very strategic. Prototyping becomes the platform where everyone can interact with the others. And only by looking at the results, as also Francesco was saying, doing it very quickly, doing it very rapidly, fast and, and iterative prototyping, can become the common language for people coming from different, different backgrounds and with different agendas also to align on on the one agenda. So here the message is to move from a mindset where we prototype when we normally know enough about something. Now we know enough and we're ready to make the first prototype and then we see how people will react. To a mindset where we make prototypes to find out what are the questions, what is that we don't know yet. So prototyping more as a mindset, as an open process rather than a way to persuade other people that the idea is good and valid. So very open, learning by doing, failing forward. At CID we say, it, uh, fake it until you make it. <laughs> so it's okay to use smoke and mirror techniques and, and just like hack things and, and see how people react and, and what kind of value everyone can bring to the table. Okay. Thanks, Anoda. Obviously that's, that's a very positive and uh, op op optimistic view of, of what can be achieved. But Pierre-Yves, I have detected a certain amount of cynicism within the light and design community. Some light and designers that, that, you know, that I've spoken to, or if you just look on social media. Uh, how does uh, technology solutions provider like Philips overcome that? Have you heard cynicism? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I think um, um, we've we've got a and, and uh, Francesco brought a, a really interesting uh, point earlier when uh, you talked about controls, because um, the cynicism, if if indeed it is cynicism that you're making reference to. Um, is uh, I think, um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I, d I don't have a um, a set answer, you know, mm. a preconceived answer to your question. To be honest, of course, it is something that we experience every now and then. Um, I must say personally, I don't experience that much of it, but it is also probably because we create ecosystems that are probably more positive. Okay, but um, I would tend to um, believe that it's, it's fear of change, you know, for a certain, you know, for a certain element of it. And, and the lose of control, um, you know, creating a, a piece, creating a vision and delivering that vision, uh, which potentially could even have different, um, you know, different, um, different lives or uh, different states is, is, is something that I, I just, just use the verb to create, you know, so that's the creator's creation, you know, and there is, the, there is this control behind it. Uh, having created a specific um, uh, contextualized experience, you know, be it in an office, be it in, a, in an airport, in a, in a mall, or, you know, lighting, lighting a building, that you want that you want that somebody, a lighting designer, you know, who probably wants to be associated with, and, 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 vouch for in a sense if i can you know present it this way this this is something that i stand for that i'm proud of that i am you know that i think is 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 co consistent with my vision which is coherent with what i want to do and which is something that i can control so um this maybe quote unquote fear of change fear of unknown and the technology aspect coming in where technology uh is used for something that can facilitate sometimes the control of things and the control of the experience, but take away from the ownership of the creator. And actually, whenever we use the word co-creation, uh, we open up the concept of having others, in a sense, infringe on your creation. It makes it way more complex to create something that you can feel ownership of and put your signature at the bottom, as it were, um, and I, I would imagine that the cynicism that you're talking about is partly um, uh, lodged there, partly you know exists there. The other, the other component is uh, is is, is um, uh, not the, just a fear of losing control, but it's um, you know the fact that yeah um, you know um, um, I'm French, but um, you you remember some Jacques Tati movies, okay? Uh, you know, which are quite iconic, or um, you know, it could even be uh, Charlie Chaplin movies, uh, you know, where the machine uh, and the technology takes over and delivers wrong experiences, failed experiences, uh, and and I would imagine that the concern is partly there, and I would say, and and I'm 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 saying this uh, with uh, you know with total humility, uh, you know, I don't I'm not. Judging, I think I, I, I as, a, as, a, as a human being, as a user, um, probably bring a certain amount of cynicism, you know, uh, in my interactions with society and with where we're going. Um, but I would tend to say that there is uh, probably a, a fair amount of um, um, just plain lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, what can technology do for me? And and I think Simona just expressed it very well. We, we, you know, we, we need, we sometimes need to create the experience, uh, the experiment, to even be able to ask ourselves the questions and the relevant questions to what it is that we're doing. So I would say, um, I don't know if you're asking me, what are we doing about this cynicism? Um, uh, you know, and and if, if you were, I would say, well, we try to make it as transparent and as open a platform to actually discuss about these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the core of it is the quality of light. At the core of it is the efficiency of light. At the core of it is the experience that you deliver with light, of course. Mm -hmm. oh. can, can I build yeah, a little on, bit? On, I think uh, when you're phrasing the question as like, as <coughs> light designers and so on, I think also last night at dinner we were wondering actually what's the role and what mm -hmm. does it mean to be light designers today? And maybe just the definition of light designers is like, needs to be updated or or kind of uh, challenged a bit because we talk about 
as you mentioned before, it's about cross-disciplinary teams who work in team to deliver a light solution. And I would, you know, challenge the fact that today maybe a data scientist is equally important as a, a, a traditional light designer in terms of creating a, a very performing, efficient, and still like a beautiful experience when it comes to light. So I think it's also interesting to talk about the role of uh, light design uh, as a profession, as, yes. a, as a set of expertise, because yeah, it's, it's changing, it's challenged. I, I certainly do think that the, the role of the lighting designer is being redefined with, with all sorts of technology that is becoming involved, but I, I can still go back to the conversations I had with Singapore lighting right. designers who, they are lighting designers and that's, that's all they want to be concerned with. Can, can, I, can I just ask a question um, in, in you know, those eight designers that you talked yeah. to? Um, you know, I, I, we talked about yeah, the, you know, the fact that LEDs really changed, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, the whole paradigm, okay? Then the controls. Um, the fact that we've got, you know, dynamic, you know, uh, an ability to dynamically light uh, pieces today is something that probably created some form of cynicism at some point yeah. as well. Um, now it seems to be, I would imagine that the seven lighting designers you talk to have no problem with that whatsoever anymore. So, you know, we're moving on. And, and on, 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 you know, the change of, I, I, you know, I think it's a, it's, we probably don't have the time, you know, to really talk about the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the lighting design, uh, the definition of what a lighting designer is today. Um, I think a lot of you uh, know him, but if you talk to somebody like Tapio Rosenius, for instance, it's really interesting to see how he does not even present himself as a lighting designer, yeah. even though he is a he's lighting a designer. Point, yeah. And he's a real case. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is, there is also an element of uh, uh, how much uh, sort of control you exert onto a design or not, which I think is one of the aspects of, uh, of that, you know, thinking more about I, as a designer, I kind of uh, create uh, a, a, yeah, exactly a certain, a certain piece, a certain look mm -hmm. and so on, while many of the, um, of the things that are about uh, um, use of uh, this technology are about uh, really adaptability of a design or maybe giving this sort of uh, control exerted uh, uh, as a person saying, you know, this space should look like this, uh, actually in the hands of end users. Uh, so part of that I think is quite important in, in, in the new design we do. I mean, it depends obviously on the, on the type of design opportunity, on the type of building and so on. Uh, people are, are definitely generating data that can be then providing insights. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, uh, people can uh, um, um, influence uh, the, the way a space, uh, you know, feels. Sure. Uh, and in the end, uh, you know, buildings, uh, designs evolve, but they need to change. You know, I mean, we can't, uh, yeah, I, well, having fear of change uh, is, uh, is wrong because uh, change is inherent in our conditions, uh, in, you know, in human life anyway, but um, even more so in design because, uh, uh, um, you know, building change any, anyway, and, uh, um, you know, you can either give the opportunities and the framework uh, to make the change more easily, and uh, design for happiness, uh, or you can kind of uh, make it difficult <laughs> and say, oh yeah, it should look like this, I'm the architect, I'm the designer, and, uh, yeah. and maybe that is a wrong approach. Well, th this is it, isn't it? And we've had a discussion about ownership mm -hmm. of, right. of your lighting design and what that entails. Well, I, I would say, you know, lighting designers, are, we very often live in our own mm -hmm. bubble, and within that bubble, we, we, maybe without stating it, we apply our own sort of Hippocratic oath to the, to the process. That as designers, we own a certain ethic and a certain requirement to, to provide a, uh, a result to, to uh, a user, to an experience, to, to a client, and, you know, not an answer, but sort of hypothesizing this a little bit, uh, as we relinquish some authority and some ownership through the process and broaden it to a more collaborative group, that's a very scary proposition because you're putting your own neck on the line in many ways in, in the design. So how, how to find the comfort in doing that it has really been perhaps a roadblock. Uh, I think there are, oddly enough, I find lighting designers to be amongst the most forward-thinking people that I know. So there's this dichotomy of, of thought between what they're willing to accept and play with within their own little sandbox and then what they're willing to show out to the rest of the world. And, and finding 
what, what we've seen is now through technology, through the digital revolution, all the way now up into bringing in IoT and how that's applied into lighting, that, that push to bring that stuff out of the, the closet and out of the sandbox and out into the public is just much more rapid. And, and it's hard to keep up and feel comfortable that you're doing the right thing while you're, while you're being forced into this uh, use of other things you may not be fully comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it hasn't been mentioned yet, but uh, human-centric lighting is part of this whole equation. I've been dying to ask this question <laughs> to a panel that includes a lighting, de lighting designers and a manufacturer. <coughs> is human-centric lighting a real thing, or is it marketing speak to, to sell more? I, mean, I would say it's, yeah, it's the fashion of the moment, uh, in, a, in a way. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, there is a certain body of research. Obviously, yeah, we can uh, we, we can we can delve a bit deeper into that if, if required. But um, I mean, the, the reality is that I think uh, what brings uh, happiness, if we want to really be, you know, is um, is freedom and uh, sort of independence to some extent. You know, if if you are given something that is. Uh, you know, designed to act uh, in a, you know, with a certain behavior and you can't uh, influence that behavior. Uh, I mean, things about politics <laughs> even, you know, things about, uh, you know, you, you f every, anyone feels, uh, I mean, some people might like actually being uh, um, uh, maybe given some guidance, other people might not. Uh, so it's, it, you know, we're all different. Uh, and uh, um, if, uh, if there is a, a, you know, a set way of doing things, uh, uh, let's say that is uh, thought, uh, you know, uh, is told by you know some expert that says you know um, lights should change like this and the spectrum should be like that because we know that is the best and uh, you know and the time of the day will change it and and so on. Um, I mean it is is yet creating another rule, another element that uh, you know you um, you might feel like being the machine really <laughs> doing it rather than. Uh, um, so I think you know there is a there is a balance uh, in in all that, but I think if we want to design for happiness and you know for people is more giving the possibility of uh, um, giving change, and for me this is uh, the more uh, uh, I mean the better way of, of designing you know in a human centric way or in a per people centric way or uh, you know yeah. end user centric way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all want to go with this one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I would just say, you know, all electrified lighting for the past nearly 150 years is human centric. Mm. You know, we're clearly not doing it for anyone else. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. and so it, you know, as the technology has evolved, we can now <coughs> dig deeper into the reasoning behind it mm. and, and find applications. Mm. But it's a, it suddenly got coined as a phrase and became this, this buzzword that nobody really clearly has a definition for and really is everything we've already been doing. It's just, again, keeping up with that pace and how you, how you bring proper design and good ethics and, and research and technology all together to create a quality project. Yeah. Simona, you wanted yeah, to? But I think, uh, first of all, it's human is much better than user. No one wakes up in the morning thinking, I'm a user. <laughs> I'm a mom, I'm an architect, I'm a light designer, or I'm an accountant, but no one is a user really. But human points more like, it's, it's more interesting because it talks about like, yeah, the being human. I prefer like being people-centered, and actually now at CID we talk about being life-centered. So. Actually, even if we design the perfect thing for human beings and for people, we might end up in the wrong place for the planet. Mm -hmm. So how can we design by putting in the center not just people, but also the planet? And then going back to your 150 years, actually I would like to be even more, a little bit more provocative. Like before the Industrial Revolution, everything was human-centered. I mean, can you imagine a craftsman to make a table for your living room that would be 30 meters longer than the space you have, or like a tailor making a, a clothing that is totally outsized for the people. So everything before the Industrial Revolution was based on a dialogue between the person who would buy and the person who would make things. And that was like a little flow of data. There was like a very, very direct flow of data between the market and the producer. And now, paradoxically, I think then the Industrial Revolution kind of messed up things a little bit. Now we have machines uh, with new logics marketing, technology, everything has to answer the logic of the machine, so we kind of forgot a little bit about people. 
And then about 30 years ago, we come back with this epiphany that we need to be customer-centric, people-centric, user-centric. But that's the way things have been for millions of years, I think, before the Industrial yeah. Revolution. Yeah. Paradoxically, I think that now, with the possibility of digitalization and everyone being connected and all the data flowing, we are in a framework which is paradoxically closer to what it was pre-industrial revolution in terms of having a dialogue with the customers than in the industrial revolution. Kind of makes sense? So, so imagine the potential of being connected to everyone and get real data information about desires, wishes, needs. I think it's, again, I'm an I'm a positive one, but I think it's an amazing opportunity. And we, ne we need to learn a lot about that ability to establish a dialogue with our customers rather than coming up with fixed solutions that we launch and then we see how things how the market would react. So, yeah, if, I, if, if I can extend a little bit on this word as well, I mean, there, is, there has been these two words actually put together recently, digital and vernacular, in a way, and uh, the makers movement is part of that. And I think it, I find it quite connected to what you said, where actually customization can happen enabled by digital technologies uh, in a way where, um, you know, anyone actually, you know, can be a designer, can be a, an artisan of, uh, of the system. And part of that uh, is, um, you know, in, in, the, in the context of of making, I mean, we kind of visualize it with 3D printers and laser captors and you know, all these sort of things uh, which are quite uh, low entry level for making, making things and you know, designing. Um, uh, I mean, anyone, I mean, almost anyone. I mean, obviously, there's a little bit of knowledge in there and so on. But the same thing is with software. So uh, the more uh, commoditization of hardware happens, actually, the more uh, we have a platform that is across vendors uh, that allows uh, us to, well, anyone, again, uh, to, to design their own interface to a building or to a lighting system or, you know. And that is uh, the opportunity in this case uh, that, uh, yeah, is opened up. I think well, certainly one thing we can all agree on is that the quality of light is, is the very important thing. But th there's no reason why we can't have both. No, theory. of course not. Um, well, earlier we talked about cynicism. Here there was a little bit of a uh, uh, question with the flavor of the scepticism, let's call it that, with the flavor of the month. Um, but, but um, you know, and, and certainly as, as an insider at Philips Lighting, I can tell you that, um, you know, all the research that, uh, that, you know, is being done still today on how light can improve a number of aspects uh, around users, uh, and as you say, humans rather than just users, um, is, is definitely there. Um, one thing is certain is that we have the ability now to actually tailor our recipes and tailor the experience even in public spaces, you know, which, um, which, which are relevant for people. And again, it's through uh, a lot of experiences of, uh, you know, uh, exchange of information to go back to the, you know, what you were saying before the industrial revolution. But I mean, um, the tools that we have now allow us to also override and to make sure that I have the right experience at the right moment. And <clears throat> you might not know what the right experience is. I mean, okay. I'm, no. However, you know, lumens I'm getting right here and the, you know, the, the temperature I have is, yeah, kind of okay for me, but, you know, could I have a much better experience and could you have a better experience if we had something different? Certainly. Well, if, if it gets offered to us, then we can at least react to it. You know, so it is, um, it, it is something that, uh, and, and I can say this uh, quite honestly also as a relative newcomer to lighting, I mean, it's something that is absolutely integral to everything we do today. And uh, that's it. Yeah. I've been told to wrap it up. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.